three, two, one. Welcome to the Mac Talks, everybody. I'm your host, Scott Johnson. This is my co-host, Chase Hutchinson. Hi, guys. Chase, tell them what the Mac Talks is. The Mac Talks are that vehicle that brings you the stories that you need to hear from business owners, entrepreneurs, and impactful leaders. That is right, sir. And today, we have a guest that hits all the categories Chase has mentioned. He's a philanthropist. He owns three successful car dealerships located in New York and Connecticut. He was a rescue swimmer for the U.S. Navy, has a beautiful family, and is a force in his community, our community actually, with his Ingersoll Acts of Kindness. Todd Ingersoll, welcome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. How are you today? Doing great, thanks. Awesome. I appreciate you uh, joining us and being able to tell your story. You have an awesome story. I've heard it a few times myself. Um, you know, I kind of look look up to you from kind of what you have done throughout the years and just wanted to have you come on the show and be able to kind of tell this story for the people that, that haven't heard it out there, the entrepreneurs that are out there, the people that are that are fighting for the type of career that they want to be able to hear, you know, a great story to kind of help them keep going. So welcome. I'm super excited to have you here today. So thanks, Scott. Um, so basically, let's just kind of start with your your journey from the beginning. So did you graduated high school in Bethel? Sure did. Yeah, okay. Bethel High School. And then you, you 1988. Went into, nice. Yeah. Nice. Way back. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> when that song was popular. Yeah, exactly. When the dinosaurs right. roomed. Oh, oh easy. Thank Settle, you. young fella. Thank you. Sheesh. Thank you. He's throwing them already. <laughs> the <huh>? millennials. <laughs> picking on the Gen Xers. All right. So so after you graduated high school, you went into the Navy, right? <clears throat> Actually, uh, I went to college. Okay. And um, financially, that was pretty difficult for my folks. My uh, dad was a teacher at Bethel High. And mom was working on getting herself through nursing school. And uh, so, you know, I made the decision to um, enlist in the Navy. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Top Gun or not. Uh, I'm sure you have. Yeah, uh, it's my favorite movie. He actually oh, likes it a lot. Good. Yeah. Chase good. actually wears a, a pair of jeans that are a little snuggle, and I <laughs> like the millennials do, and I always refer to them as his Tom Cruise <laughs> jeans. So well, God, well, so, you know, it obviously was one of the greatest advertisements ever for the Navy, and my oh, yeah. goal was, you know, the motorcycle, the blonde, and, and fly jets. <laughs> and so I uh, went down to the recruiting station told him my dreams and he said well if you haven't graduated college you can't do that um and so i said thanks very much i'm leaving then and he said wait a minute wait a minute as he should have um and said well what if we could get you in the navy and you could be flying you know uh, on the aircraft and i said well do you get the jacket and he said well yeah you get the leather jacket and i said mm -hmm. okay well that's half the battle <laughs> and uh next thing you know i'm shipping off to um which it's kind of not that logical, but the center of the country, Great Mistakes or Great Lakes, uh, Illinois, for boot camp. Oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> that's where they do uh, boot camp for the Navy in the center of the nation. So, Oh, wow. Uh, after that, it was the dead of winter. I ended up in Pensacola, Florida, where you um, begin your training as a air crewman. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all along, people kept saying to me, gee, are you a good swimmer? And, and I would say, well, yeah, Macauer Park in Bethel, which is where, you know, I did all my training. I made it all the way up to Shark. I could go out to the uh, raft alone. Yeah, right. And uh, <clears throat> that's, where we, that's where we began. So air crew training was pretty intense. It was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of fun. Um, when you were done with that, uh, it, it kind of ended with you're put in a simulated helicopter, put in the water, flipped upside down at night. Because when helicopters crash in the ocean, they mm -hmm. immediately flip upside down. Yep. And you have to learn how to get out of them pretty quickly um, or you'll go down with the aircraft. Yeah. And so when that's that, probably one of the main drills that they that do. is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when that's done and you finally graduate, you know, your waist has gone down to about a 34. <laughs> so you're in really good shape at that point. And um feeling pretty good about yourself. And then my buddy said, well, where, where's your next stop? And I said, well, I got to go to rescue swimmer school. And he said, dude, are you a good swimmer? And I went, yeah, well, I made it all the way to shark at Macauer Park. <laughs> and uh, off I went. And so the day I arrived at rescue swimmer training, it was a, it was a beautiful uh, morning. And I remember distinctly, it was kind of like the buildings in Fairfield Hills in, in Connecticut, kind of those white uh, trimmed out brick buildings with the big palladium windows. Yeah. And 
you know, I, I walked my way up to the front of it and there you get to the, the door and it says United States Naval Rescue Swimmer Training so others may live. And, you know, that kind of hits you when you, when you see that for the first time. Yeah, big responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. Yeah. And, uh, and I went and uh, I got in the door and there was a young man there who was screaming, uh, you know, wasn't the most welcoming uh, reception <laughs> uh, and telling us to run. So we began running mm-hmm. and um, we never stopped running basically <laughs> the entire time we were there. And when you're in the military, your training consists of week one, day one, week one, day two, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right. And this was an eight week training process to become a U.S. Navy rescue swimmer. And each week, you know, it gets more and more intense. And a typical uh, day as you're progressing, you'll swim in the ocean for a couple miles Mm -hmm. um, and you'll run for four or five miles. And that's usually your morning. And then you do kind of the, you know, the training portion where you're learning the techniques of saving people during the afternoon. Yep. Um, So I made it to my seventh four day. Um, So seventh week, fourth day. How long is the program total? Eight weeks. Okay. And so um, almost done. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this is kind of the culmination of your training. And on that day... Um, it's a night exercise. You walk into the pool, you're alone and uh, make your way over to the tower. And it's, um, when you get there, they turn the lights off, you know, as only the Navy can, you know, you hear that, Mm -hmm. you know, and now it's pitch black, except the red lights turn on in the Mm -hmm. pool. You make your way up the ladder and you kind of hear that low voice, you know, petty officer Ingersoll, you ready to commence training. And uh, you say yes, and then you hear, and then the spray hits you of the water. Yeah. You know, and then the waves start in the pool, and you walk or you kind of slide yourself over to the edge, and then the noise of the helicopter, thump, 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 and you push off into the pool. Boom. I know it's a simulator, but it sounds like it's pretty. D- it's <laughs> pretty on. intense. Yeah. I, I think the only thing that was beating harder than the thump of the noise was my heart. Your heart right? yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's all by design is to try to create adrenaline that same, right? yeah. yep. and give you that sense. When you're in the pool, you clear your goggles and you clear your snorkel and you're kind of ready to go. And you declare that you're a U.S. Navy rescue swimmer and you're looking for survivors and, um, and you're waiting. Mm-hmm you know where they are, they're underneath you. Mm. Uh, you just don't know when they're coming. Those are the instructors, mm. right? Those are the instructors. Yeah. So the guy that's underneath me comes up, grabs me, I grab a half a breath of air, he pulls me under the water, and we're kind of now in the struggle, right, to mm. gain control. And, um, you know, we were down there for quite some time, uh, what I thought was quite some time, and ultimately had to release, and, um, you know, I had to tap his hand because I, was going to pass out yeah and when i did i floated back up to the top he got out we talked a lot about um my lack of commitment to the united states Mm. um a lot about my a lot about my mother (laughs) um so yeah after all that (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, there's some very uh curt discussions yeah they're not gonna pat you on the back no get back on the horse guy (laughs) no 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 and then of course the next question is is are you ready to read do your training. And of course, now you say, if you say no, you're automatically out of the program. Mm -hmm. If you say yes, then you go right back in it again. So I say yes, in the pool, I climb the ladder, the lights are off, the thing, the spray, the the entire thing. Except this time now you have more anxiety than ever before. Yeah, you feel Mm -hmm. more pressure. More pressure. Yep. And, um, but I've made a commitment this time that I will drown myself yeah. before I get out of that pool. Mm. Wow. And, um, I figured, you know, at the rescue swimmers, so let them, you know, restart, <laughs> yeah, they'll restart, restart my heart, yeah. Yeah, uh, right. whatever yeah. it is, they, they can handle it. Yeah. And, um, so off I go into the water and this time, fortunately I grabbed a full breath of air before not one, but both instructors grabbed me and they sandwiched me in between them and dragged me down to the bottom of the pool where we struggled. Yeah. Um, and that went on for probably over a minute. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, I learned a valuable lesson that day. Several of them. One was that if you can get breath, you can't convince yourself to drown. At least I wasn't capable of it. Okay. And so, you know, when you can tap somebody's hand and come up, you do. So Mm -hmm. I did, uh, they dragged me out of the pool, dragged me to the opposite side, marched my team in, um, made me ring the bell. Um, because that was the second attempt and I had failed and one by one, each of my teammates turned their back, um, down the line 
and you're standing alone. They rip the shirt off your back, toss you down into the locker room, throw you and all your stuff out the front door, and you're out. Wow. wow. And that's um, that's a pretty tough lesson <laughs> yeah. for imagine. you know a 19 year old yeah. kid. And you know, uh, I did what anybody would probably do in that case, and I called my mom, mm-hmm. you know, promptly. Yeah. And mm-hmm. we didn't have cell phones uh, for Chase's clarification. We <laughs> used, used a phone booth, so uh, and you didn't get a trophy after that. No, either. we didn't. And we dialed ten att zero one two zero three and reversed the charges and called home. And I remember distinctly my mom saying, you know, there's three things. You know, one, we don't have the resources to help you. Um, so there's nothing I can do. But the second thing is, is that, you know, I have faith in you and you have faith in God. What you've forgotten is to have faith in yourself. Mm. And if you want this bad enough, you can go figure out a way to get it done. Wow. And that kind of concluded the, um, the phone call. Yeah. And I don't know that I felt a whole lot better about it, but it was kind of some tough love and it was all she could give me, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it ended up being super valuable and would set um, kind of a cornerstone in my foundation for my business years later because things will roll in in life that are pretty tough. Yeah. And I think all three of those are important. Have people who believe in you to have, um, you know, a belief in a higher power and then also to have, you know, a belief in yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Um, that night, my buddy said, "Hey, do you want to go out to a club?" Which is you know, that's logical, right? You know, yeah, lowest yeah, day of your life. So, we, yes, <laughs> yeah, right. we did. And uh, there's the blonde. I see this beautiful girl, and I follow her around. And she comes up to me and says, "Do you want to dance after being in the ladies' room for a bit instead of following me around all night?" And I said, "Yes." And uh, I didn't know it then, but I had met my wife um, that evening. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that was the night I met my wife. Yeah, so, that's great. The same night as, as right that wow. you got kicked out. Yeah, that's or that you that you that you failed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Why you gotta say it like that? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. So, so, that. <laughs> so, so it, the story goes, um, you know, and I'll pick up the pace on this one. Um, it basically evolved to. You know, I, when I had to go to captain's mass, which was like a court hearing. Mm-hmm. And when I get there, it's determined that, you know what, this kid is going to have to probably go scrape paint off the side of a boat, you know, which I wasn't all that comfortable doing. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm here to do the Tom Cruise gig. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm from Connecticut. I'm not chipping paint. Yeah, That's right. not what we do. <laughs> so, um, so it, it really, uh, I dragged my right leg into captain's mass. And, um, I remember the officer in charge said, you know, what's the matter with your leg? And, you know, I said, well, gee, you know, probably a sprained ankle. And he said, well, no wonder you couldn't do the swim. How long is that going to take to heal? And I said, several weeks. And the weeks, the couple of weeks I needed was for my class to graduate and the class behind me to graduate because it was too embarrassing. I was Uh, humiliated hmm. that they were there. Gotcha. And so um, he granted it and nobody opposed it. And, and I said to him, well, I was on my seven, four day. And so, you know, I'll resume, you yeah. know, right around there. And that's when he said, no, son, you, you start week one, day one, and you begin the training. Oh, wow. At Hello. Yep. Wow. And when I went back several weeks later, I was like an instructor. I basically was physically completely as strong as they were. Were you training in no, the, no, I just rested. <laughs> Honest, did honestly, you really? Yeah, I just rested. Okay, my body needed to rest. Okay, yeah, my yeah, mind yeah. certainly did too. Getting through where you had gotten yeah. was enough training. It was probably. enough training. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It was and more of a mind, almost like a mental thing at that point it, that you had to kind of prepare exactly. for. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think that whole um, time period allowed me to just kind of get myself centered, refocused, and when I went back. I found myself, I was actually the captain of our team, uh, the, the second great. go around. And I was out working one night doing pull-ups because you had to do so many to graduate. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was cool was one night the instructor who was in the pool pulled up. And I remember he was driving a light green Honda Accord, mm-hmm. like a 90 whatever in that lightish green color. And the sun was setting and he called me over to his car and he said, we just didn't know if you wanted it bad enough. But if you were willing to start from the beginning, then you're the guy we want in the helicopter with us. Yeah, that's great. And so it was a test. Yeah. And of the 77 of us that were in my second class, seven of us graduated. Wow. 90% did not. That's usually probably the... 
That is the attrition yeah, rate. Yeah, because they need, you know. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, but they want people who are that crazy. That dedicated. Yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. That, that I mean, it's got to feel even so much better when you went and was and were able to complete it after, you know, I think it would have felt just as good yeah. the first time. I don't know that But I, I mean, the that. turmoil that you faced, you <laughs> know what I mean? Like, I, from what it sounds to me, and, you know, you kind of mentioned it before, kind of set you up for... It a lot of things in life that you were going to kind of encounter. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it was great to be able to experience that at a young age. Although at the time, I'm sure it didn't feel that. No, great. <laughs> it didn't feel that great at all. It was, um, you know, it was. Look, you're facing what you think. You what you what I lacked at that time in my life was the understanding that the sun would come up the next day, mm-hmm. that life would go on, that it would be okay. Yeah. Because mm. I didn't have that experience yet, mm-hmm. and. Um, and once I figured that portion out, it was like, you know what, most things that life throws at you, you can remember that and say, you know what, look, it's going to be okay. Take a deep breath. The sun will come out the yeah. next day and life will go on. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and it wasn't life or death. Yep. You know, this was, this was not what we were facing here. So yeah. it was just a challenge yeah. and you had to rise tough to one. it. Yeah, yeah. And a tough one. So, but not the end of the world, certainly. So. So you met your wife down in Florida, I and did. then you brought her up to this lovely yeah. state of, yeah. of uh, Connecticut. Yes. Um, and you guys, you now have three kids. We do. Right? Catherine, Daniel, children. and Jonathan, yeah. One yeah. of them is uh, up at Penn State, right? She is. See? Nittany yeah. Lions. She is a Nittany Lion. She's great college. She's, uh, yeah, she's. Have of, you gone to a game up there? Uh, yes, we did. How big is that stadium? Well, there was 111,000 the day we were there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a great school. That's amazing. That's a great it, it, it's, thing to be able to she's live, had you know. a great experience there. That's awesome. Yeah, she's getting ready to go into her senior year, although she's denying that. She's a little ahead, and she's. Uh, oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, she's like, I'm not, I'm not my senior year yet. And that's like, funny. Hey, actually, you are, honey. That is funny. So, and then law school for her. So, yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, congratulations, you've done a good job. She is fabulous. Yeah, yeah, you know, great. Like, anybody who's got a daughter knows just how wonderful they are. Yeah, as far as yep. I'm and your little guys too. I see them. They seem like they're really, you know, not so little little anymore but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Danny, they seem like they're great kids Danny and John uh junior in high school and um freshman in high school yep and are both you know strong-willed and kind and generous and smart young people who I couldn't be more proud of the men that they're becoming yeah you know they'll be terrific terrific role models I think for their own kids someday that's awesome yeah I, I love to hear it yeah I that's kind of the uh I think the litmus test for success in life is how your kids are doing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, for me anyway, the greatest no. measure of success for True. myself is, yeah. you know, how are they? Cause so. I mean, they're modeling you. They see what you're doing obviously. So well, know. more their mother. I think <laughs> she, gets, she gets the bulk of the credit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She definitely does. So, so you came back up to Connecticut yeah. and then I know that, you know, you got involved with Saturn. So tell us a little bit about So Saturn was a really cool car company. Um, they sold cars, Chase, for in case you didn't know. But uh, I think my dad had a Saturn as a company car. A smart man. In the nineties. Yeah. Saturn was perfect for the young guys. I remember I was, I think I was like eighteen when I when I bought a yeah. Saturn, and I used to, every time my friends were around, I'd be like, check this out and it do the bam, thing. Bam! Hit the doors. Just doesn't dent. You know yeah. what I mean? So. You know what was cool about Saturn was it was a company that was really based on a principled way of doing business, mm-hmm. which was allowed people to all be on the same page. So it's hard to tell folks that they're empowered to make decisions, that um, they should treat people a certain way, but not give them the foundational pillars on how to do that or what to base those decisions on. And Saturn was all about that. And it really put people first. Mm -hmm. And so um, it kind of spoke to me, that company. So I came back up here and said, well, I'll go back to school. And um, my mom was sitting at our kitchen table and reading the newspaper and uh, geez, that's a <laughs> big, large white They used thing. to print it. Yeah, we, we'd print it and read those daily. <laughs> and in there was uh, an ad to, here's your chance to break into cars. Uh, that was the ad that was on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I went and applied and I was the first person um, that they hired um, to come on board as a sales consultant okay. in, in Danbury on Federal And you never Road. sold Obviously, you never sold cars. No. You never really did sales before. Well, you're a people's I mean, person. Yeah, yeah that part I think was fine. Just being um, yourself around people. Is, yeah, but yeah. you know, the, the brand was not about lying, cheating, and stealing. Yep. And um, 
I, I couldn't have done that. It's so it wasn't what that company was about. Yeah. And you know, very quickly, and, and they actually didn't want to hire people who had car experience. Yeah, they wanted folks yeah. who were not involved in that business at all. And pretty quickly, we kind of rose through the ranks. Uh, and next thing you know, I was in a leadership position in sales and then did some finance work and we got ready to open up our second store. So from a time frame, 1991 was when I was hired. Mm -hmm. Um, in 93, we were opening our second store in, um, Watertown yep. and the gentleman, Steve, who was with me, uh, he was my mentor, um, in Danbury. He said, I'm going to go run Watertown. You're going to stay behind and be the general manager in Danbury. So that was 1993. Um, two, two years in. Yeah. A couple okay. of years in. Yeah. Yeah. Which is almost crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I, I was 23. Yeah. Um, yeah almost every person there was older than I was. Um, and so, but it, it was a great lesson in leading people because I think it taught you how to lead from a position of humility and, um, and really from a servant's standpoint that you're there as a leader to be, to make their life easier yep. and to be on bended knee. Yep. Um, and when you model that for your team, um, that ends up being what is, given to the guests that mm -hmm. they're serving themselves. And so it took some time, yep. but slowly but surely we got there. <clears throat> and there was an exchange of ownership several times in the um, uh, auto park back in the day yep. uh, in Danbury. And ultimately the decision was made by Saturn Corporation that they didn't want our stores owned by the conglomerate that it had become. Okay. And so they said, you know what, we're gonna buy our stores back. The, these two Saturn stores back, Saturn Corporation. And as a matter of fact, any publicly traded stores that are owned nationwide, we're going to buy all those back. Oh, wow. And so they bought 70 of them. Ours were the first two that they actually bought back. So next thing you know, we're working for Saturn. Um, and we got a really nice guy who was a trainer in Tennessee. He wasn't all that focused on... Um, profitability. Yeah. So the stores kind of went from making decent profit to losing a lot of money. And Steve, my mentor, um, couldn't stomach that, you know, yeah. it's like, I'm not watching this guy drive our business into the ground. So he deselected and left. And I was saying to Steve, I'm like, just hang in there. Cause he can't, this can't go on yeah, forever. We through, right. Yeah. yeah. We can get through this. And, uh, ultimately the decision was made that he's like, no, I'm out. And he left and I stayed. And probably about six or seven months later, um, it was determined that, you know, he was leaving mm -hmm. the guy that was running or running the stores and that I would become the executive manager over both. And so now I was running both facilities. Wow. And in 2000, there were rumblings that they were going to sell all the stores that they had. And so I said, you know what? Um, I don't want to work for anybody else. I, I really don't want our stores to go to another stranger and yeah. we got to start over again. Yep. So I want to buy them. And, um, and of course they said to me, well, do you have 2 million, 500,000, <laughs> <laughs> 2 million, $500,000. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, moving into, I guess we were pretty well into 2001 at that point. And I didn't have the 2 million, 500,000, but it turns out there's a bank within general motors, Oh, wow. Um, that was started. It's a little unknown bank, but it was started um, during the Great Depression to help dealers um, get through tough times or to expand or grow. And um, and I said, well, what about this? And they said, yeah, well, that's, you know, not a lot of people use it, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. And basically, I had to come up with $300,000 mm -hmm. to, to buy into the business, and they put up $2.2 million. Wow. And what's amazing about that is, is they're the only bank in the world that will lend you money mm -hmm. when you don't need it. Or excuse me, when you need it and there's no assets. Oh, okay, I got it. Well, think about it, right? When you buy a house or a car, there's yep. an asset. Yep. When you buy a business like a car dealership mm -hmm. and you're not buying the building, what is there? That's true. There's nothing. You just need cash and lots of it. You, yeah. gotta, you, you, you need a lot of money to run it. And um, so in 2001, I became the dealer principal um, and then owned both stores. Um, awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And then how it works. And how old were you then? 31. Okay. So it was about 10 years later. Yep. Um, and so, and by the way, you know, there's not, a, I don't think a day or a week that goes by now that I go, gosh, 
I don't know how I ran this place not knowing that. So it's a constant learning curve in our business. So Always, yeah. if I'm thinking back, you know, on 30 years of how much, you know, knowledge was acquired in that time frame, it makes it even more crazy uh, yeah. that I was able to do it then. But That's failure awesome. just simply wasn't an option. Yeah. You know, it never dawned on me that, you know, we could fail. And when we went in, the 300000 I remember taking a second mortgage on my home cashing in my savings bonds and liquidating my 401k in order to do it, um, which comes with a huge tax penalty, it turns out. Yeah, well, it's like 20% or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, well, yeah, I think it's right? more than it's that. Like, it's almost yeah. 50 yeah. by the time you're done. And, um, and it, the other thing is anytime you're with Motors Holding, they set what your salary is. So about 10 people on, in our company earned significantly more than I did um, for the time period that you're in business. But each quarter that goes by, you redeem their stock. Okay. And so you kind of so work your way. You're getting sweat equity, basically. That's exactly yep. right. Yep. You know, just enough to get by, uh, but not putting any money really aside or in the bank. And what's interesting, too, um, and I think it's kind of a misunderstanding in business is, you know, cash is king, right? Mm-hmm. You need a lot of cash to run a business, and, and especially the automobile industry. You know, it, it uses a lot of cash. But my cash was never growing. Any money I made went to redeem stock or pay taxes. Yep. So I was always left with the same exact amount of working capital that I started with. So if the business was growing, I always had the same amount I started with, yeah. which meant you had to work with leaner and leaner and leaner amounts of money constantly, which means you're honing those skills all the time. Yeah, you're constantly how to refining running. them. You know, you need to know your margins. You need to know Everything. all of those numbers like to the point. That's exactly yeah, right. That's awesome. So in that time period, right after we were able to acquire um, the property in Watertown, and then we bought the property in Danbury. On now you can make road. the gains, like you said, like right. owning the property is where that's it's very a, helpful. Yes, you know, yep. um, because typically in a deal, he who controls the land controls the deal. Yep, right. And mm-hmm. so that ultimately is a, a, a very important part to any uh, business. And uh, so it took me about seven years, and we got the franchise paid off. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that time period, I was able to, my mentor, I was able to actually bring him back That's into awesome. the company. That's crazy. So Steve was running Watertown. I was running Danbury and, um, and we got it paid off and we got the property acquired and Newtown Savings Bank was actually the bank that helped me do that. And a great lesson in life there was banking local, you know, whether it's Newtown Savings Bank, um, or any of them in the area, yeah, you know them, mm-hmm. they know you, and I think it's incredibly important to do business with the people that can help you during very difficult times, um, and they were coming, they were on the horizon for us. I yep. mean, it was. I've been there. It's, it's a lot different when you can face a person mm-hmm. and they know you and they see you in the community. Yep. They go to bat for you, yes. that person that's, you know, yeah. and not to say that they take huge risks, yeah. but they're going to take a risk because they know you, that's your business. You know, they see you around town and stuff like that. So yeah. local banks, I agree. I agree a hundred percent with, with that. And that, that's something I've always done with inside of business as well, because you have to, because they will, you know, take care of you in a sense that the bigger banks won't because they don't know you. You're just a, you're just a social security number. Yeah. Them, yeah. You know? My uh, grandfather used to say banks never lend you money when you need it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, yep. No, and, it's and, true. And it is true. So, you know, so we're feeling pretty good. We got the yeah, business kind of paid up. off, we got, the, we got the property acquired, yep. and then the entire world blew up. Yep. You know, we entered into the Great Recession. Yep, the recession and, hit. And it was really, um, as we all know now, um, unparalleled. Yeah. Nothing had ever really in our lifetime, and hopefully never does again, no. hit like that. And in the automobile industry, obviously, there's tremendous yeah, upheaval. Um, yeah. And I was serving on a dealer council uh, for Saturn at the time. And, you know, the word came out that, you know, they were going to put four brands up for review. And mm-hmm. General Motors consisted of eight brands in the U.S. at that time. So there was um, Buick, GMC, Chevrolet, and Cadillac. And then there was also Pontiac, Saab, Hummer, and Saturn. And um, the latter four were on the outside of the cup looking in. Yep. And it was, you know, going to be determined whether those brands would go forward. And so the question was, was, does anybody want to buy them? 
and start bringing cars in through this terrific network of 300 Saturn stores in the country. And Roger Penske said, yeah, I do want to buy Saturn and I'm going to get whoever to build cars, but this will be the, the, the whole team that will actually deliver the cars and deliver this great experience. Because in order to be a Saturn dealer at the time, you were amongst the top four or 5% of all GM dealers in the country. So it was really the best of the best. Yeah. And uh, Roger Penske said, yep, I'm doing it. And for the next eight months, um, he vetted out the entire process and he was taking delivery of Saturn on September 30th of 2009. Mm -hmm. And um, that day GM executed their documents in the morning. The website was going live at midnight that night. All the computer systems were switched. Everything was basically a go. All of the people in GM that worked for Saturn transferred to his team. Yep. And I got a phone call at three o'clock in the afternoon from the Wall Street Journal because I was handling for the dealer council kind of media relations. And uh, the guy said to me, hey, this is Paul at um, the Wall Street Journal. I just wanted to get a quote from you that Roger Penske decided not to do the deal. Ugh. What a way to find out, huh? Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was, uh, that was pretty tough. Yeah, you know? I can and, imagine. And you know, I said, well, what are you talking about? I just finished reviewing the website. And he goes, we didn't even know. And, um, and he said, yeah, it's over. And I said, oh, I got to go. And, <clears throat> you know, it was, it, was a, it was a devastating afternoon to have to face your team, right? And, yeah. and talk with them and gather them up and say, hey, you know, it's not going to work, the Saturn portion, but hang in there because we're going to be okay. Yeah, I'm going to still keep yeah. fighting. And yeah, we'll figure out what yeah, we'll the just, next step is. Yep. And I remember coming home that night and Tammy greeting me at the back door and saying, I'm sorry, everything you worked for is gone. Yeah. And I said to her, I said, I'm married to my best friend. We have three healthy children and nothing is as bad as my seven, four day as a rescue. I was just getting ready. Yeah, I can imagine. I was getting ready to say that. And and it was so true. Mm -hmm. That really was the high watermark for difficult moments in my life. Mm -hmm. And there was, that taught me that the sun would come up, that, you know, life would go on and have faith in all three things and that we'd figure it out. And the next day I got a phone call that said, look, there's gonna be a reorganization of every dealer in the country. And because GM is going to go through a reorganization itself, they can choose which dealers they're going to have and which ones they're not. And um, you know, we are going to get you Buick and GMC. And uh, so on Christmas- Do you think that that had a lot to do with how they saw how hard you fought to try to keep the Saturn brand? Because well, I, I think it had more to do with um, two other three factors one um the 10 acres in danbury on a brand new facility that would go dormant great play obviously um, yeah <laughs> the fabulous team that i had uh working there and the fact that for many months just with saturn we outsold every other gm store in the area combined wow so um we sold a lot of saturns and that was with the the smaller location or the or the big both, okay. uh, but you know the bigger one. Obviously, we didn't have open very long. That yeah. was before it was yeah, going so you away. Fully run, fully yeah, run with that. And so they they said, look, we're going to try to get you Buick and GMC. And then I locked myself in an office, a war room, and with um, clear pads of paper and stick notes, and <laughs> started working on. And it kind of reminded me now when I saw that movie Apollo thirteen of what it was like because the meter couldn't go over. There were certain yeah, things. Yeah, I love that part. Yeah, we we, <laughs> yeah. we couldn't do it. Yeah, you know, um, take it out. Yeah. Yeah, and, and exactly, yep. and and it was one of those situations where we were lean with cash because I had just finished building the buildings. Yeah, I had just finished paying off Motors Oof. Holding. You were vested. <laughs> yeah, and none of your working capital had increased, yep. right? So you still had basically what you had eight years ago, um, which is a really tough position to be in. But one of the first things we needed to do was go out and buy cars. And so we went out and bought four or 500 Saturns from stores that were gonna close immediately, mm -hmm. which gave us enough runway to get the brand off the ground. And, um, and then we laid out a plan to sit with the board of directors of Newtown Savings Bank and tell them about, look, we're gonna get this, we're gonna work through that, we're gonna make all this stuff happen. And I remember John Martozzi, he was the chairman and president at the time, saying to me uh, when we left the meeting, you know, he put his hand on my shoulders and he said, you know, sometimes we don't buy the deal, it's the person. 
that's awesome. That's that's the local bank. That is the local I bank. I don't know that the big corporate banks are ever saying that no, comment. They would, they, they would probably get in big trouble if they said that. Yeah, well, and they probably would have said, you know, you know, thanks so much for being on the show, but the party's over. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. And turn out the lights. That's and, great, though. And they didn't, you know, and, and they really were by my side they the entire time. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I mean, you gave them a history of what of yeah to do that, yeah. you know, so that's great. And so um, pretty shortly thereafter, um, we got our first little glimmer of hope. And on Christmas Eve, so so if you think about it, Saturn went away September 30th. And Christmas Eve was the day we were given Buick GMC for Danbury. That's great. And so then I went door to door in Watertown, literally just walking in dealerships, asking their dealer for the dealer principal and if they'd be interested in selling the franchise. And the guy who had Buick and GMC there said yes. And, um, you know, he shot me a number, which was pretty extraordinary. Uh, and I didn't have the money at the time. And, um, you know, I've had such great blessings, you know, through all, all the stuff, the people that were put in my path to help and, and kind of guide me through things. And, um, you know, he shot me a number and, and I said, no, that sounds terrific. And, and I very shortly thereafter um, got a phone call from GM legal who said, gee, and completely not connected to this at all, but said, you know, you built a building in Danbury. I did. And we took your franchise. You did. Well, we're having a one-time settlement and it's non-negotiable. And it ended up being the exact number that I needed f to buy the, the franchise in Watertown. Wow. And, uh, everything just aligned. It just aligned perfectly. Yeah. And so that check went to him and, um, you know, and I closed on that deal in April of 2010. And then the Chevrolet and Cadillac was in play in Danbury. And the owner there agreed, you know what, he was going to make some different strategic moves and sell it. And he did and uh, allowed me to pay him over the next five years, which was great. That's awesome. So we closed on that um, on August 31st of 2010. So it was my 40th birthday. Nice. And 11 months to the day, we went from no franchise to all four in Danbury and the two in Watertown and the company was saved. That's awesome. That's um, just, it's funny because you want to say that it's, that it's luck, mm. right? But it's not luck. You know, it's, you need a little luck. Yeah. Well, what, what the, the, the quote that I love the best is, um, luck is when hard work meets opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? And if you put yourself in that position and you work hard, like you always have, you know, good things are, good things are going to happen. And in the back of your mind, you almost kind of knew that you're like, I'll get through this rough patch and, you know, we can kind of keep going because of the things that you said that you, mm -hmm. that you encountered, you know within the Navy and just, you know, yeah, growing and I, up. I think, you know, a lot of people work hard. Yeah. And they're and and put themselves in the right position and, and the right thing doesn't necessarily yeah, that's happen. True. You yep. know. And um but what I think is most important about that is is that you never take for granted um the people that helped you get there. Um the community that supported you. I mean, we had people at the time that came into our facility that said, look, I don't need a car, but I think you need me to buy one. That's awesome. And, and they did. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's great. and, and we had folks on our team who went to the HR department and took a cut in salary to help the company get through and never said anything. Yeah. They just said, reduce that's my great. salary. So, you know, we are pretty proud of the fact that when you ask folks, you know, how many did I have to let go at the time? You know, I always tell people it's none, but more importantly, how many left is the same answer. None. They yeah. all stayed. That's great. And um, <clears throat> and then very quickly after that, we had to actually put an addition um, on the new facility in Danbury because the team was actually growing. It was now growing. The company <laughs> yeah. went from this death spiral to expanding at such a rapid rate. And service in our industry is really important. Yes. You know, I think it's often overlooked. A lot of um, dealer principals come up from the sales side. Um, and so service is, you know, treated almost as an annoyance. Mm -hmm. And um, and I love the service side of our business. You it's, guys do an amazing job. With well, service. it's, you know, we certainly stumble plenty. But when it we It happens. Do, I mean, yeah. plus with the volume that you guys are doing, it happens. But you always make good. That's, right. that's the thing. The, you make mistakes. People make mistakes. Yes. But you always make good. That's, you know what, what, that's what you have to do, right, is recognize when you've made an error and try to correct it. And be kind. 
Yep. You know, I think that that's a big piece to it too. So Danbury ended up getting, uh, you know, this new building and then almost immediately after we had to put a 50% addition on it. And um, so to give you an idea, our service department went from 17 service bays to 33. Yep. And um, now we're open seven days a week. We've started a second shift at in the evening to uh, accommodate, um, you know, the business that we have coming through. So you know, we've been very lucky. <clears throat> and then uh, several years ago, the Pauling opportunity over in New York State became available. And uh, Steve um, had now become a partner in the organization. You know, one night he had said to me, he said, you know, if this doesn't work out, and this was in the depths of everything, you know, I want you to know I'm the last person who walks out of here with you. I That's won't, awesome. I won't leave you. And, um, and, and that was the day, you know, I was for sure told myself he will be a partner in this and you know and I'll get him a portion of the equity in the company and so um when that's Pauling, great. yeah when Pauling came along uh, he's been running that facility and we did motors holding up there again and this year instead of seven years to pay it back he had it done in about 18 months great so you know um that store has been wildly successful it's, yeah he's done a terrific job running it with his son up there and so it's um yeah, the three locations, kind of Danbury's the mothership in the middle, Watertown is, you know, to our east, and Pauling is to the west. It's funny because I bought a Saturn when I was really young. Mm. Just like I said, it was cost effective. You could put a ton of dents in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you couldn't put a dent in it, actually, yeah. um, which is great for a teenager. Um, and then throughout the years, I've always purchased from Ingersoll. Mm. Um, and whenever I, I think it's f with the Saturn, and then I think I've purchased four cars uh, mm -hmm. since then. They call me like the demo king. Like every two or three years, it's like, <laughs> oh, hey, so-and-so's wife, the demo got turned in. Let's yeah. go sell this one to Scott Johnson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, but one of the things that I noticed when I'm talking to service is I feel like it's a direct connection like of you. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like it's you speaking, you know, and that comes down to, like you said, being a leader and having your people speak your message. Um, we saw Bobby Valentine speak at the at the Better Business Bureau, mm -hmm. and that's one thing he said. Make yeah. sure your people speak the same language as you, and that's so huge. One of the things we do is every new team member that comes on board in our company, I spend a day off-site with them. Wow. So, uh, and obviously it's a class, it's not a loan. Not in a hel yeah. helicopter yeah, si yeah, yeah, yeah. simulation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's, you know, typically 10 or 12, you know, folks, sometimes 16, sometimes 20. And we spend the first part of the afternoon going over the history of the company because I want them to know where we came from. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is all about the culture and what my expectations are. And, and I talk to them about our five core values and we call them the three C's and the two T's. Mm -hmm. And um, they're very simple. It's commitment um, to guest enthusiasm. Um, and that's, you know, I don't want a satisfied guest. I want somebody who's enthusiastic about our, our company. Yep. Commitment to excel, no half-hearted efforts. Uh, continuous improvement, we can always do better and yep. should. Um, teamwork, and not the corporate buzzword of the 1990s, but truly, you know, if, if you see somebody struggling, you lend them a hand. Mm -hmm. And then the one that binds all of them together, which is trust and respect for the individual. And that's the other T. That's the one that is the human and, and compassionate side to the whole business. And when you give people those five core values and you say, look, base all of your decisions on this, it really, it's not enough to say somebody's empowered to spend $500 to satisfy a guest. Because yep. maybe it needs to be 1000 Maybe it needs to be twenty. Mm -hmm. But when you say to them, look, when you made the decision not to honor a coupon for $10, which one of the core values did that uphold? Yeah. You know, and very soon it gets quiet. And, and then you say, well, and if you had done it, which one would it have upheld? And they'll say, well, it would have done continuous improvement. It would have done trust and respect. And you go, correct. And so then you can co coach and counsel around those five core values. And I always tell people, I'm like, you think of core values like the love that you have for your children. Mm -hmm. They are, it's set in bedrock. There's nothing that changes that. You know, it is terra firma. It doesn't move. And these don't move. Our mission can change. Yep. What we do can change. The values. 
the core values do not change ever and they are set in those things and so hopefully that's what you sense uh when you're there yeah and, and i think it is i think that that's what the team does and you know we take feedback from our guests very serious um you know we try to improve upon the things that they talk about and then you know the other things we have a bunch of silly rules that we do too like you know when you're within six feet of a guest you know you say hello yeah um, and you call him a guest too, which I think is great. Yeah. Well, it changes how people are treated. Yeah. You know, right. somebody who's a guest in your home is different than a customer. Yeah. Right. You know, um, I always love that. I always thought that was a nice touch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's, so there's a lot of little things that you do. Um, and it's about doing a thousand things, 1% better. Yep. It isn't about the little things. It's the little things. Yep. It's not typically about, you know, moving mountains. It's usually yep. just little and things. And that's what people appreciate. You know? I think so. I think so. so. Um, you know, one of the things that you said is, you know, the, a lot of the community came in and, you know, even the bank and people who purchased cars from you. Um, so one of the things that I love that you do is, you know, when you finally got there, you gave back, you know, when you got through all those struggles, mm. you give back and you do it consistently. Um, I love, I love to see it. I mean, you do some really, really good things. Kind of wanted to just mention a few. Um, and then I want to run your, uh, your radio spot that you're doing now, because I think that's think that's awesome. So, um, you know, some of the things that you do around around town and you know around this area, mm -hmm. Edmond Town Hall Theater, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. You do what the, the, you replace the projector there, I think. Oh yeah, and then we did do that. Yep, and then you do the the free movies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's second weekend of every month. That's awesome. Um, I remember when you spoke for the, what class was it? Was it 17? Yes. 2017? Yeah. Bethel yeah. High School? Bethel High School. Class. That was my uh, my high school, so they asked me to do the commencement speech there, yeah. And then you were going to give away, what is it, one car? Well, yeah, we, we actually saved that for the end. Um, we did three scholarships that we set up that day, and then a grant for the teachers, and then at the end, asked the kids if they would like to send in a handwritten uh, essay front and back two pages about why they were uniquely deserving of a gift and that we would go live on Facebook and deliver that gift. Yeah. And, um, the day actually we were going to do it, you know, there were two other essays that were just so touching to me that, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't leave them behind. So yeah. we, we did three. That, that video was great of you guys just driving around in the rain. Yeah, pouring Soaking rain. Soaking wet. <laughs> pouring rain. Soaking yeah. wet. <laughs> Didn't matter. That made it all. Oh, and just the kids' faces and stuff like that was just, was just great. Um, that means so, that no, means we, still got, we still got some time. Uh, uh, a few okay. more minutes. Yeah, I know that, I know that a, you got to get out of here, too. That's no, why I said I'm it. Fine. Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so then I know you do the thing with the laptops, which is I mean, so the laptops great. is a cool story that, um, you know, that started in Bethel High where they asked us to sponsor kind of their prom, you know, after prom party to keep kids from going out and partying. Yep. And uh, and I said, well, well, how about a laptop or something significant that they could auction off? And they said, oh, that'd be great. And, and the kid who won it the first year actually had a full ride to West Point and didn't need it. Mm -hmm. And he noticed a kid that he thought could and gave it to him. Well, that kid went to his guidance counselor and said, it changed my life. Wow. He's like. I don't have a computer at home. Yeah. And so this allowed me to actually play sports. I didn't have to run to the library after school. And it got us thinking, well, how many other kids are there like that? Yeah. In Newtown and Bethel and Danbury and New Fairfield and New Milford and Brookfield. And we now have, um, we'll have almost 600 of them deployed in those schools this year. That's great. And so they can sign them out and they have them for the whole year. And it was really neat at Danbury High, we were dropping off the next wave um, and one of the young women came up to me and said, I've had an Ingersoll computer all four years. And she goes, <laughs> and I just applied to college. And, uh, and, we, and she goes, uh, and I said to her, well, when you get accepted, send me a note. And she did. And uh, we brought her over a brand new Mac. Uh, that oh, she could that take, is great. She could take to school with her. So, That's you know, awesome. those... Those are just, um, it's actually the best part of my job. Yeah. It really is. Cause I, you know, I think we were, um, I think we were saved and, yeah. uh, and I think, I think back. we owe it. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think you have a, re a moral responsibility to give back to the community that's been so good to you. Yeah. And I mean, as other business, I know for me as a business owner, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you hear other business owners doing that, I mean, you love your community anyway, but yeah. when you, when you can kind of 
snowball that for yourself as well. Like, yeah. you know, he's doing something. I should do something for my community as well. That's you know, awesome. when you're in the position, you yeah. know, so um, I think that's awesome. Um, one of the things that you've always said that I love that I've heard you say a few times is, um, you know, when you come from when you don't have money. Mm. And you need, and you go into business. Mm -hmm. You have to take huge risks. Yes, like life. And I, I'm in the same boat. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't come from money. Everything that I've built, it kind of is I've built by my own. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, it resonates with me. So you know, it hits really hits home mm -hmm. because it's true. You have to take huge chances. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things that I've always admired about you, along with you know the the things that you do around the community. Um, Something new that you're actually doing that I heard a radio spot for that's really, really awesome. I heard it the other day, mm -hmm. um, saw it on Facebook, so I wanted to kind of share that. We can hear your awesome radio voice as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, all right, here we go. So I'm just going to get this casted up here. And cast that. Nine thousand views already. Good job. So this is running on the radio currently. Yeah. All right. A version of it. Okay. This is a little long. They say actions speak louder than words. words. Ingersoll Automotive doesn't normally advertise on the radio. I guess we believe most folks know. We have amazing values to offer when it comes to Chevys, Buicks, GMCs, and Cadillacs. You see, I believe the way cars and trucks are sold and serviced matters. Simply, kindness matters. We've been blessed with another terrific year and want to give back to the community that it takes such good care of us. So throughout November, send us an email or a note on Facebook, heck, even a letter to the store, if you have an idea on how we can help someone and truly make a difference in their lives. Then starting in December, we're going to go live on Facebook and share some good news for a change. And together, we'll brighten someone's day, week, month, heck, even their year sharing some kindness on behalf of my family and the team i represent i'm todd ingersoll thank you for being so supportive of ingersoll auto we look forward to your ideas so email us at kindness at ingersollauto.com that's the kids from the the cars right yeah yeah, yeah that's them that's that awesome the cars so yeah tell us a little bit about tell us a little bit about that so um <laughs> We uh, helped 98Q get an ad um, purchase this summer uh, from Chevrolet nationally. And um, I don't normally advertise on the radio. Yeah. And so as a thank you, they said, gee, we're going to get you some spots. And I'm not real big on the one ninety nine a month. Come back, you know, <laughs> push, pull, or pull your trade. It's $4,000 on every single thing. That you Even though you have the voice for it. Well, you're I, not. I, I, I just think it. It's insulting. Yeah. I think it's yeah. insulting. And it's never that when you get there anyway. <laughs> well, if it is, I mean, you know, honestly, if you have a hundred dollar car, how can it be worth 4,000? Yeah. You know, it, it's not logical and it's just, it's moving stuff around. Yep, so that's what it is. Yep. So it's, you know, I, and I think it's, um, I think it's wrong. And so, you know, I didn't want this to be about that. And so I reluctantly I said, okay, I'll, I'll do the advertising, but it's not going to be anything that has to do with selling cars. Yeah. And, um, and so it was like, you know what, we should come up with some program that allows people to, um, tell us, you know, how we can make an impact. And, uh, and I think, you know, look, obviously there's brand recognition and what we stand for, but let everybody else, I mean, it's, I think understood that we have got great values when it comes yeah. to you know, Chevrolets, Buicks, GMCs, and Cadillacs, and they're going to be great prices. Um, but what sets you apart from doing business elsewhere? Um, and how do you say to somebody, um, we're not going to steal, cheat um, in service, but we're going to convince you that we're going to do that to you in sales. I, I just don't think it lines up. No, no. And so um, I just pen that at my desk literally in a couple minutes. I just jotted down, you know, it's easy to talk about stuff from your heart. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I went over and cut the spot at 98Q and, you know, Mike was like, I'm not sure I like the part where you say you don't normally advertise on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, but it's That's true, Mike, I, I, I normally don't. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, we're getting a great response. We've gotten, uh, probably a hundred and some odd already into us about That's great. different things. I and can't so, wait to see it when you guys yeah, roll it out. We're, we're anxious to do some pretty cool stuff in yeah. December, um, which is a good month to do it, I think. Yeah, well, that's when people are going to need it the most, too. So. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so right now is usually a part of our show where we have Kev, our intern, ask one question. But Ooh. Kev is not here. So, so Chase. Chase the millennial. Oh, I knew this. I knew it was going to come to this. So but, Chase. So here's the thing about um, about my question is that, you know, before the show, I was thinking about what to ask you. Um, I think the most obvious thing was to just ask, hey, what if you had one piece of advice um, that you could give to um, a young entrepreneur like myself, someone who's just starting out? I mean, I'm literally just starting out. Um, I've been here for a year, um, but someone who's in the beginning stages of, the, of their career. Mm -hmm. um, if you had one piece of advice, what would that be? Um, and, I'll, and I'll open that question up to you. But I just want to say, like, man, it's, it's hard. I, you've covered so many things. Um, in this podcast that it's almost like the what's left what other advice could you give um but i'll, I'll go ahead and pose that question to you and see kind of what you know what i you would uh i would tell you grit no quit that's awesome and um you know i think that a lot of people throw in the towel too soon and they don't hang in there and something angers them their feelings are hurt um, you know, they feel as though it's like, you know, I'm not getting my promotion. I didn't get this. I should be further along. And sometimes that's the stuff that actually separates the ultimate winner from the loser is the person who actually hung in there long enough to, to find success. Mm. And, um, that's what I would tell you. And then never forget, obviously what got you there, mm. you know, and remain true to your core values, whatever they are. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah no, Chase, that's perfect. I, it's funny because Chase, he, he's kind of almost like the situation that you had with your mentor. Mm -hmm. Like I, I foresee him as an entrepreneur, even though he works for me, because mm -hmm. he puts in the type of time and he does all of the things that need to be done. He comes in early, stays late. Yeah. Um, so I foresee us having hopefully a uh, a journey like yours, where I'm able to bring him in, mm -hmm. um, and 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 be a partner because that's the way that he works yeah. um, and he's going to earn it slowly over time. Yeah. Um, and I told him, I said, you know, cause he's, he's a great young kid. And I told him, I'm like, you can be better than me because yeah. you're going to learn what I have. Plus you got the loyal yeah. <laughs> education <laughs> <laughs> and didn't come cheap. Either. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so remember chase grit, no quit. Yeah, that's I great. Will. We're going to actually get that You're on welcome. the wall in yeah. the, uh, in the office. Maybe we yeah. oh. putting different quotes around and stuff, the office. Yeah. So, yeah, but, uh, yeah, let's do that. But listen, I really, really appreciate you coming by. Glad to do it. Um, Love what you're doing with the acts of kindness. Thanks. Can't wait to see that stuff roll out. Me too. Um, have a great Thanksgiving, great you holidays. You and your family. You too, Scott. Appreciate Take care, it, man. All right. Happy holidays. Thanks. Thank you. Chase. you too, Thanks man. for coming. Through. All right, guys, we'll be signing off and uh, until the next time. See you then. Thanks.